So what's in a name? Lots of cash. That's this week on Motoring 2001. TSN's Motoring 2001 is brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oils, formulated for the vehicles you drive and the way you drive them. And Midas, keep a good thing going. Go Midas! You know, it seems you can't turn on the television these days without seeing one of our fellow human beings trying desperately to win a million dollars, either through a multiple choice question or trying to be the survivor among some other greedy folk on a desert island. But let's just say you do win the big million and you're looking for a set of wheels that will reflect your newfound wealth. Well, I think I found it. It's the 2001 Bentley Arnage Red Label. The price tag? Well, let me put it this way. You could probably purchase 15 to 20 Toyota Echoes for the same price. More on this car later. But first, we're going to revisit with a young Canadian engineer who we met a couple of years ago. He had a passion for car racing and a dream to work with a world-class team. came out of school uh, in Canada as an engineer and uh, into motorsports you know I've talked to him over the over over the past he said he'd watch me race at most sport and when I was younger and and uh, watched me race at various events around Ontario was a motorsports fan and uh, I guess he decided that that's what he would like to get into and hooked up with Brian Stewart who's also Canadian who runs a a fantastic Indy Lights program that I won won a championship with in 1990 and then uh, got the opportunity to come to work for Team Cool Green the same year that I was joining the team so uh, that's that's worked out great. It's been four years since we last saw you. Yep. Uh, you had some dreams back then. Tell me how things are going and how that dream's going. It's worked out pretty well. I, I mean uh, four years on I'm with the best race team in, in Champ Park so uh, I guess I can't really complain, can I? I've got a problem. The only one that will work is one from Todd's yesterday. job, data well, he has a variety of things, data but data uh, data his data main data job data. Is, is data analysts. So he analyzes data that we receive during the sessions and during the race. In the race, he does all the fuel calculations. So if we run out of fuel, it's Todd's fault. Hey, Frank, add another half gallon to that. Well, we mainly rely on Todd for uh, vehicle dynamics. Uh, he, he calculates a lot of the spring rates and ride heights and, and the core settings of the race car to determine you know, what's going to give us the best overall package for that particular weekend. He almost almost got switched over on the Dario's crew over the winter and I kind of inter interjected and, and told Barry that that's, that's not going to work out with me. So uh, him and I have a great relationship and, and uh, you know in the off season we do some skiing together, some snowboarding once in a while and uh, he's been a fantastic part of the whole team. Race weekends are pretty hectic. Um, Thursday, uh, come to the track, set up. Um, I still help set up the pits, all the electronics. Um, then I'll do a little bit of prep work. Uh, I always do a little bit of prep work for our race engineers. And then Friday and Saturday, you start running. And, um, you know, uh, during the session, I watch the telemetry, um, do some data analysis. And whatever you can see um, that the chassis is doing, wheel spin, uh, center pressure, all kinds of stuff. By the letter of the rule book, I would say it's gray. Yeah. The letter of the rule book implies that there's a sensor, and in this case, there isn't actually a sensor. That's right. You know, so we've made car to wear what we're doing because as soon as somebody sees those things on there, they're going to go oh, running yeah. and screaming. It's, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, you still have to go to work every day, um, but it's, you know, it's not your average engineering job. It's certainly a lot more exciting. and. Every weekend, there's there's a direct result that you have to gauge yourself. So, yeah, I really like it. He's a fan as well as, as he understands understands the car from the technical side of it and from the racing side of it. So he can see both sides of it as as well as any of my mechanics can. So, 
that that's important. They've got to also be a fan. They've got to want to do this because it's not an easy job for any any of them. The, the hardest job is is for these crew guys. They're the ones that are on the road all the time and away from their families all the time. And I'm lucky enough that I'm able to take my family with me and and get some time off in between. Whereas guys like Todd and my other crew guys, they're working, you know, seven to seven every day of the week to to do this to make me look good. You've got to have a good attitude, obviously, because the days are so flexible. I mean, we never, ever work the same hours. Um, there's always going to be something that crops up, depending on what happens during the weekend. You know, maybe a crash, maybe, you know, some other sort of electrical failure. Anything can happen. So uh, you've got to be really flexible, and Todd's one of those guys who's really good at that. It's become so competitive in the series that you've got to have these people that really understand the data and what the shocks are doing and what the traces mean and, and what this means. I don't understand it. It's not my background. My background is to sit in the car and drive and, and Todd's background is to pull everything out of the car that, that can be read from the car and understand all of it. And we've got another Canadian that was my Indy Lights mechanic in 1990, Len Gauchi, works on my car. And uh, we've got a good group of guys here and in, in the best pit crew, I think, in the business. I see the water temperature, right? A team like Team Green will not generally hire somebody they don't know. Uh, you, you, so a, as you move along through the ranks, it's important that you get to know people and, and you try to do a good job and present yourself well. And ultimately, um, it'll probably work out for you. It's just a matter of timing. And you know, he's two thirds of the way there. He's got the hard part out of the way, so hopefully it's, uh, it's a little bit easier sailing for him now. business these days, well, it's like Halloween. You wake up the next morning and your tummy doesn't feel so good. More later on Kenzie's Corner. So Ford's F-150 is a huge truck for several reasons. First of all, it's been Canada's perennial bestseller. However, painted a silky black, add some chrome wheels and a few Harley Davidson badges, and well, the gawk meter goes off the scale. This week on Test Drive, we take a look at the Harley Davidson version of Ford's highly successful F-150. The Harley Davidson F-150 differs from the norm because rather than jacking it up to height the size, it's actually been lowered by an inch but rides on enormous 20 inch rims wrapped in 275-45 tires. It also carries the delicate orange pinstripe and badge of a company that enjoys one of the world's largest cult-like followings. The detail even goes so far as the grille, where the fine horizontal slats resemble the cooling fins on Harley's famed V-twin. You know, with 260 horsepower and an astounding 350 pounds-feet of torque, this 5.4-litre V8 is never a loss for power. Indeed, it spreads it across such a broad spectrum you can get from rest to 100K in under nine seconds. Now, that may not seem like much, but when you're perched up there in the driver's seat where you can see clear into the next county, it sure feels like it. The other thing they've done particularly well is to tune the exhaust system. At the low end, it burbles. At the high end, it barks. You know, there really is nothing quite like a large North American V8 that trumpets through a pair of three and a half inch tailpipes. The only transmission offered is a four-speed automatic. The shifts are smooth and the ratio perfectly matched to the engine, providing a happy medium between the need for power and the quest for fuel economy. The lone quibble has to do with the lever itself. It's chromed, looks great, but places a nasty reflection of itself on the windshield, which is very distracting. Inside, the Harley theme continues, where everything is either chrome or black. You also get a really neat set of spun metal finish gauges, cruise control, a great sounding radio, and beneath what looks like a saddlebag, well, there's a six-pack CD player. The handling through the pylon surprised. Lowering the truck not only gives it a purposeful stance, it improves the road manners to the point that almost defies description. The front suspension features a double wishbone design with coil springs, gas pressurized shocks, and a stabilizer bar. 
The rear end uses variable rate multi-leaf springs and gas shocks. The springs and roll bars have both been tuned to suit the Harley's low rider demeanor. Body roll is almost non-existent and the response to input linear and predictable. Now if that doesn't sound like the description of a truck, it's because the Harley does not handle like one. Even the steering, traditionally one of the weaker aspects of the dynamic package, brings a crisp and positive feel. The net result is a degree of stability that belies the Harley's size and considerable bulk. You know, while the Harley F-150 comes with four doors, the back seat is a bit of a write-off, at least for somebody of my size. The seat base is too short and there's no headrest. However, as a spot for kids, it really does work because that's where they should be and not up front, even though you can deactivate the airbag. The other bonus, when you're loading stuff in the back here, you don't have to fight your way past the seat belts, which is always a pain. Stopping power is supplied by a four-wheel disc design with full anti-lock. The system functions well for the most part, delivering short, straight, controlled stops. Sadly, the pedal feel is on the mushy side, meaning it requires a lot more pressure than you expect to yield the desired brake performance. You know, the F-150 is hardly a true Davidson, but it does add an interesting spin to the market. True, they've only lowered it by about an inch, but it works wonders in the ride and handling department. As for the engine and its 350 pounds-feet of torque, it doesn't come any sweeter. Our Midas tip of the week concerns wintertime fueling of your vehicle. Matter of fact, we've got several tips. If your car calls for super or high octane gas, you've got to use that year round. But a lot of people find that their car that was, was prescribed to run on low octane fuel requires mid-grade or super during the summer to avoid pinging or detonation. However, you might want to think about the fact that in the wintertime, the type of driving that you do in the lower ambient temperatures will, in many cases, prevent a lot of those cars from pinging or detonating. I own one vehicle like that. In the summertime, I run 89 octane, but in the winter, 87 is absolutely fine. Now, a couple of other things. It's also recommended that you keep the tank as full as possible in the wintertime to minimize condensation getting in the tank and, of course, water vapors from getting in there and freezing up your gas line. Another thing that I've noticed in the wintertime is that people take off their gas cap at a self-serve, sit it down on the trunk lid of the car, and if they haven't cleaned the car off, there's what happens. They get a little plug of snow in the bottom of the cap. Now, if they're not watching, that ends up back in the filler neck. I had a customer's car the other day. I took the cap off, and it was all full of snow in there and in the base of the cap. Now, if you inadvertently do that, make sure that you bang the snow out of that thing before you put it back on the car. Now, if that situation does happen and there's nothing you can do about it, gas line antifreeze is certainly your next step. And as a matter of fact, in the Canadian winter, it's a real good idea to run this in every tank of fuel. It, it'll just, it's just insurance policy to make sure that you don't have fuel line freeze up. Matter of fact, a lot of times when we have fuel tanks out of cars in the wintertime, we'll find little globules of rusty water floating around in the bottom of the fuel tank. If enough of it gets in there, it gets into the fuel filter. Sub-zero day, it can freeze the fuel line and stop you dead on the road. So think about using this all, all the time. It emulsifies that moisture, breaks it up, and allows it to pass through the fuel system so it doesn't rust the bottom of your tank or the lines or freeze you up and stop you. That's your Midas tip of the week. This is a new Bentley uh, Arnage red label uh, with a 6.75 liter uh, V8 turbo, uh, 400 horse, 620 pounds torque. It's really a special car because it's a big car, but it goes like a rocket. Arnage evolved in 99 as a green label with a twin turbo, um, four and a half liter, 350 horse engine. This car now for 2000, the red label has the uh, 6.75 liter, has the red label 400 horse turbo. It's a full leather Connolly interior. It's 12 coats of uh, two-stage paint now. It's clear over base paint, um, full Wilton carpeting, the finest burl walnut veneers, and of course a hand-built, hand-assembled, uh, bench-tested engine. 
This is an all-year-round car, believe it or not. You've got traction control now, you've got all the modern driver aids, all the safety equipment you need, and uh, it's a very heavy, uh, safe, road-going car all year round. We expect to sell probably six, seven units this year. It's really all we can get. Um, it's 320000 plus taxes. Um, your typical buyer now with the new red label is a much younger, youthful, kind of a mid-30s, 40s, real enthusiast, likes a good car, lots of power, and loves the Bentley image. You've probably been asked this question a million times, but what makes a car worth $320,000? You know, it's the pedigree, it's the lineage, it's the heritage of the mark. Um, of course, you know, there's a lot of aluminum panels in our cars. It's the hand-built quality and, and the bespoke, bespokeness of this car that makes it worth that kind of money. It's very limited production. Unfortunately, we had to refrain from thrashing around the 2001 Bentley Arnage Red Label on the test track, but at over 400 horsepower, believe me, this car can perform. And with that in mind, Bentley has announced it is returning to racing with Le Mans in 2001. All right, let's now join a man who would look really cool behind the wheel of a Bentley, and of course, that's Bill Gardner. $325,000 car, Brad, you gotta be crazy. Well, how about my pickup truck? 321,504 kilometers on it and you know what even with a head start like that it'll probably wear that Bentley out it'll be running when that Bentley's in the garbage I'll bet you a hundred bucks on that let me see now pickup truck at about 30,000 bucks a pop I could get about 11 pickup trucks for what you paid for that Bentley Brad you're probably one of those seven guys that's gonna buy one too aren't you Anyhow, we've got some email to, to uh, answer this week from one of our viewers, Ron McKenna. He says, I, I'm, I missed your show on the importance of reds, but maybe you can answer my question. I have a 92 Pontiac Sunbird having a problem getting any heat. I've been told it could be an airlock. I replaced the thermostat already. Could you please explain to me what is an airlock, how it occurs, and if this is my problem, how to solve it? Well, airlocks are something that I usually deal with as a mechanic immediately after I've serviced something on the cooling system of any car today. In other words, I've drained the coolant out to replace a rad water pump, heater hose, whatever, some component of the cooling system that holds coolant. I've drained it out and then when I go to refill it after replacing that component, it, I have to bleed the air out of the system to get all the coolant back in. And on some of today's cars it's difficult. 92 Sunbird's not all that hard in most cases. Some cars are worse than others in this respect. But that's a problem that mechanics usually have to deal with. The only exception to that, Ron, would be if you've got some cylinder head gasket leakage on your car or a water pump that's uh, aerating the cooling system, then you could have a situation where you're pumping air into that cooling system. But you'll usually have some other attendant problems as well. If it's a head gasket problem, you've got a pretty poor running engine and some, some uh, major coolant loss as well. I think what you've got in all likelihood is a situation where you may have a leak that's drained the coolant level down to a level where there isn't enough coolant to get up into the heater core or maybe you've got a circulation problem like a block heater core or a block heater pipe somewhere where coolant is not getting through the heater core adequately. You said you changed the thermostat. I'd caution you and other viewers, when you're changing the thermostat or any other component on a modern car, make sure you get original equipment. Don't get a cheap imitation one because sometimes poor quality parts can cause you problems just like this. Number one thing though to do, check the coolant level, check the circulation, check for a block heater core. I think you're probably gonna find your problem. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 2001. Have you ever overeaten at a family celebration or holiday time? Well, of course you have, we all have. Next morning, you feel terrible. You swear you'll never do it again, but you do. And you know, I think our car company executives have fallen into similar gluttonous habits. A bunch of years ago, every car company decided it had to have global footprint, massive economies of scale, but they all have indigestion now. I mean, Mercedes-Benz has finally abandoned the fiction that the acquisition of Chrysler was anything but a takeover. Listen, when one partner ends up with 67% of the business, that's no merger. And what's happened since? Well, the stock price is in the toilet, the car cars aren't selling, all the American executives that made Chrysler such a valuable takeover target, 
Well, they've all walked the plank, either at Sword Point or on their own. Some of them took some of the treasure with them. And they can't sell any car without a huge incentive, which means no profits. BMW was doing really well as a high-end niche player, but they too decided they needed mass market cars and four-wheel drives, so they bought a Rover. What an unmitigated disaster that's been. Hundreds of millions of dollars down the drain. The two top executives lost their jobs, and now BMW has abandoned that project. They've cut the car company loose to sink or swim. It's going to sink. And they've sold Land Rover to Ford. Ford, of course, has been buying up every high-end brand they can think of. They started with Aston Martin and Jaguar. Now they got Volvo in there. And yet, with all their manufacturing, marketing, and engineering might, they still can't make a dime in Europe. And a couple of uh, four explorers falling over for no apparent reason seems to have paralyzed the entire company. In Asia, well, the Korean industry is in its usual shambles. Daewoo is bankrupt. Kia was taken over by Hyundai. Hyundai's pulled their car company away from the rest of their business interests, which are going down the drain. Even in Japan, Nissan was a sinking ship without a bailing bucket until Renault took them over. Still too early to see if that's going to work out. Mitsubishi's in the hands of the Daimler Chrysler conglomerate. Even Toyota and Honda, traditionally the most independent of car makers, they've got global projects that aren't really working out that well either. Where is it all going to end? Well, who knows, but the next 10 years are going to be really interesting. But one thing I wish the car companies would learn is something I learned a long time ago with my very first car, a little wee Fiat 600, and of course my tiny perfect wife, that sometimes bigger just isn't better. I'm Jim Kenzie. You know, after spending a couple of days with the 2001 Bentley Arnage Red Label, I've discovered a problem, or maybe it's more of a dilemma. Let's just say you've got enough cash lying around the house to fork over $350,000. Well, heck, a vehicle like this, of course, demands a chauffeur. Therein lies the problem. I mean, it's so much fun to drive, you wouldn't want to sit in the back. I don't know. Life can be so difficult. That's it for now. We'll see you next time out as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. A car of the year should be something that alters the automotive landscape. It should change the way we think about cars. It shouldn't just be the remake of an old model. It shouldn't necessarily be just the best looking or the best performing, not even the best value or the best selling. Above all, it should not be boring. Now let's meet our 2001 Vehicle of the Year. TSN's Motoring 2001 has been brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oils, formulated for the vehicles you drive and the way you drive them. And Midas, keep a good thing going. Go Midas!